Oh boy, here we are. Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortmaster, and welcome back to another Worm Girl reaction, where, um, yeah, I'm going to finally watch her What Happened in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina full story analysis video. And yeah. Oh god, this one's gonna be, this one's gonna take a while. Yeah, so if you didn't uh, see my reaction to the first video where she was talking about, like, the story of uh, Fear and Hunger 1, um, that was about an hour long. This is just under two and a half. So this is not going to be a surprise in literally any sense of the word, um, but this video will be cut up into multiple parts. Um, initially, I was thinking, eh, maybe cut it, uh, cut it up into two, but given how, like, additive reactions can be to, like, an original video's length, if they're done properly, um, I might have to end up cutting this into, like, three parts. Again, I don't know at the moment. But yeah, all these parts are going to be published on the same day, and there'll, of course, be links to the next part of whatever video you're currently watching at the end of it and in the description and, you know, all that good stuff. So... Yeah, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will, will lead to my Let's Play of the Day as well as the other parts of this reaction. And with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started then, shall we? Because I know for certain that when I have to get around to actually editing this, this is going to be a pain to render. Okay, so this game obviously takes place in a more modern time. about Termina. Yes, please! In my analysis of the first game, I was able to use Termina's canon events as guideposts. It's established, for instance, that Enki, Moonless, and Ragnavaldr survived their trips to the dungeon, and that Lagarde came back a changed man. This meant that certain events couldn't be canon, and that others had to happen, one way or another. Termina is a new game, and Part 3 is several years off. So this time we'll be so working without the be benefit of game. established canon. We only know what can happen, not what must. So in this analysis, I'll instead be presenting the story as the player receives it, and where appropriate, I'll chase down and explain possible alternatives. I'll also occasionally be diving into some theorizing based on the limited evidence we're given, but if this is meant to be an analysis of the work itself, I'll try to stick to the facts. So that's why this one is so long. It's because she's not going to be able to show a complete, uh, a complete story. She's going to have to cover all of the branching paths. Oh, uh, okay. Hopefully that doesn't make things too complicated. Okay. Fear and hunger is intentionally told in a vague way. We're often given Wonderful. contradictory facts, and pretty much everything can be suspected of being a product of unreliable narration. It's also a running theme in the series that two seemingly mutually exclusive facts can simultaneously be both true and false. It's a Schrodinger's canon, folks. Schrodinger's spot canon. Apparent contradiction. Consider it carefully. Most importantly, remember that this analysis is mine, and while I have certainly done my homework, that doesn't mean that I'm right. Well, too bad, because I'm going to take your word as gospel. Ultimately, what the story means to you is yours to decide. With that out of the way, we first want to orient ourselves. Fear and Hunger takes place on an alternate version of Earth. Many places and people are similar, but one major difference is that gods and monsters visibly exist in the world. Or at least they used to. The mythology yeah. of Fear and Hunger states that the god Sylvian created the world. Her husband is the god Grogoroth, who seeks to destroy everything. Not out of malice, but only to give Sylvian room to create more. Okay. Sylvian and Grogoroth had a child, Venushka, who became the god of nature. There was also the trickster moon god Rare, whose light reveals truths that cannot be seen in the day. Okay. And the god of the depths, who holds dominion over the desperate, the rotten, and all things that dwell in the dark. These beings make up a group known as the Old Gods. On a clock okay. in Termina, what, really? you can see a collection of their sigils, and note that some are unaccounted for. Oh, okay. We'll circle back to this later. There are three other entities which are a bit more obscure. The first is Igaigetsu. This is said to be an eastern deity who is sought out by warriors who have lost their purpose. Getsu is the Japanese word for moon, but that could be a coincidence. In any case, not much else is said about the being. Okay. 
The trivia is a little more interesting. She's called the architect of the human body. She is mostly referenced by a few abilities which allow the user to sacrifice limbs or organs to the goddess in order to perform feats of medicine via the principle of equivalent exchange. Oh, okay, so we're dealing with These alchemy here. These could be old gods, but if so, this is never confirmed and we don't really get any more explanation about them. The unassigned clock symbols could belong to them, but without confirmation it's impossible to say for sure. At the very least, they tell us that we don't have the full picture. There could be many more divine beings that the game simply doesn't tell us about, especially among the other cultures of the world. Yeah. The old gods are unknowable, all-powerful entities on a scale the human mind could never conceive of. They are living concepts that are ever-present in the world and simultaneously infinitely remote. Yeah, I mean, that generally seems to be how gods usually work in most uh, forms. Vanushka is not simply a powerful guy that causes nature to exist. He is nature itself. Yeah, I mean. And so on. The second group of deities are known as New Gods. New Gods are mortals who have made a pilgrimage to the lost city of Mahab yes, and sat in the throne, thereby ascending to godhood. Unlike the old gods, New Gods usually appear more or less human and are active in the world as individuals. They have amazing powers and appear to partially exist outside of the normal boundaries of time and space, but they are neither omnipotent nor indestructible. They're more like superheroes, capable of conquering kingdoms and uniting people, but ultimately temporary and fallible. New gods are classified by which soul they have, which is something akin to a zodiac sign. Yeah, Every this was... living human has one of these souls. Olivia's backstory tells us that being born just after the stroke of midnight, and thereby on a different month than her twin sister, caused the two to have different soul types. Henrik mentions his soul to the player in the same casual cadence that one might say they were a Sagittarius. Yeah, this was something I had to look up while I was doing a reaction to her first video, because she mentioned, um, like, characters having different types of souls, but didn't elaborate on it at all at the time, so I was very lost and had to look it up. So, so yeah, I'm glad I did my homework. The Kaiser Critique, a document found in Kaiser Turner, critique. makes it clear that Fear and Hunger's world uses the same months as our own. If we refer again to the clock in Termina, we can see 24 unknown symbols, which may suggest that there are 24 signs, two for each month, so it would seem. Or alternatively, it could be sort of like a, a Chinese calendar sort of thing where they, uh, where the, the zodiac signs or soul types are looped um, over like a two year time span. In no particular order, the known souls are the ancient, decrepit, latent, shadowed, radiating, enlightened, endless, dominating, tormented, solitary, tainted, blank, heartless, mourning, chaotic, caressing, suffocated, and changeling. Well, some of those sounded a lot worse than other ones. Like, um, yeah, I don't know what I'd do if I had a decrepit soul. If the clock theory is correct, this would leave a further six unknown souls. As with zodiac signs, a person's soul is said to influence their personality in the course of their life, but ultimately people have free will. Okay. I mean, that's good to know. When a human becomes a new god, they are nearly always overwhelmed and enslaved by the power they receive. To some degree, they lose their former individuality, becoming an avatar of whatever soul they embody. In Fear and Hunger, this is revealed to be a trap laid by the old gods to prevent ambitious mortals from climbing any higher. Okay. However, while we the players learn this, it remains unknown to most of the world. Yeah, he's just smart. The oldest known new god is Betel, who appears to have reigned some time after the year zero. It was Betel who had Mahab's grand library constructed. Betel and the other new gods of his day would eventually be deposed in the 5th century by a group including a mortal wizard named Nasra, and Betel's divinity would quickly be mostly forgotten. Yeah, because again, like, uh, I mean, she'll probably say this, but, you know, the whole thing with, like, gods is when you, like, sit in the chair to gain god powers, you kind of overwrite the old, the old new gods, and they're shoved into, like, a, a new god retirement home, dark room, where they just watch reality happen. That, such weird mythology, man. This would seem to be the fate of most other new gods, as the phenomenon is referenced a few other times. Future generations only seem to remember them as kings or mythological figures, not as real deities who had power in the world. Nasra is a recurring okay. figure in both games who best represents mortal ambition in the face of divine might. As a new god, Nasra was extremely brutal. He conquered the Eastern Sanctuaries, this world's version of the Ottoman Empire, and led it to be the dominant force in the world. Oh, okay. However, he ultimately remained unfulfilled, quickly realizing the limits of his newfound power as a god emperor. 
The other new gods, sitting in a hall that essentially serves as a retirement home once their tenure is up, <laughs> complained that he behaved in extreme and cruel ways unbefitting of his station. While he's certainly just that kind of guy, this probably speaks of the frustration that he felt when he discovered the divine glass ceiling. Like a kid grown bored of cheating at Grand Theft Auto, he had all the power, but none of the satisfaction. That's one way of, se of putting that. The final divine group is known as the Ascended Ones. History tells us that a man named Almer was born in antiquity, the son of someone known only as the False God and a virgin mortal. He would travel False to eastern God. sanctuaries, helping the downtrodden and calling out corruption wherever he went. He became very popular with the poor, and the sultans eventually took offense. They had him crucified, but when he died, he was laid to rest in the city of Mahab. Shortly thereafter, he returned as a god and led his apostles to overthrow their evil rulers. They established a new faith, and much like Christianity in the real world, this would largely replace the worship of old gods in the West. This marked the dawn of the common era. Were they zero, zero, the zero Okay. This is a point a lot of people seem to miss. Both of these games take place in locations where the old gods are unusually active, but outside of places like the backwater city of Preheville and the Dungeons of Fear and Hunger, Almer's religion is so successful that it has basically driven the old faith to the fringes. We meet characters who follow them, certainly, but these are strange and special people. By the time Termina takes Very place, strange. most people in the world have never heard of the old gods. If they have, they consider it outdated superstition, or their understanding is very limited. Yeah, as they would. Venus dark priest Enki Ankarian claims that he witnessed the death of the god of the depths, and that Vinushka, the old god of nature, fought a long and brutal war against human civilization and was ultimately tamed and killed. But what is death to such a being? Yeah. That is not again. dead which can eternal lie, and as long as the barest trace of a concept exists in the mortal mind, it has power. As it was said, as it was said in the first video, um, the what was her god? Uh, what was her name? The the god that created humanity, the one that with the really pointy boobs. Um, she left because uh, as the like old gods, they are like the embodiment of a concept, but. The, uh, but she and her and the other old gods left because humans all being individuals had slightly different beliefs and ideas of those concepts and as a result were never able to love her the way she loved them and also her form of love also involved like merging two people's flesh together into a new being called marriage very weird again what do you expect they're old gods they're w creepy but yeah where was I going with this? But the power is less than it was. Or at least, it is less present. Even the old gods who still live have left the world. The pure concepts that they represent became diluted as humans came to understand them better. No one person's idea of absolute and total destruction is exactly like anyone else's. Therefore, Grogoroth cannot exist in the world in his true, pure form. The same went for every other old god in turn, but though their primary selves have pulled away from the world, the traces left behind by the old gods are still able to affect reality, carrying out their residual will and granting magic to those who learn their secrets. Okay. The Vatican's dark priests would continue to quietly follow the old gods in addition to publicly spreading their worship of Almer. And Wait, what? And of cults still exist which venerate them, but by 1942 the old gods have largely been forgotten, while Almer remains relevant to most of the common folk. I, is, are we just going to skip by the whole fact that this world's Vatican still worships the old gods while still spreading Christianity? That's essentially almost like if the real life Vatican like worshipped Cthulhu or something in secret. That okay? No, no explanation or expansion on that one. Almer brought about renewed peace and prosperity for the Western world, but this began to falter over the centuries, and by the year 809, Europe had fallen into a dark age. The Fellowship, a group of four from the continent of Europa, ventured into Mahabr, beheaded Nasra, and claimed the throne. Now bolstered with the help of four new gods, this allowed the kingdoms of Europa to finally claim victory in their war against the eastern sanctuaries. Thus was the western world brought into a prosperous medieval era, though this too would eventually fall apart. Because it always must, does! And the cycle was set to continue. In 1590, a man named Lagarde was prophesied to bring about a new age, and ventured to Mahabr to try to find a way to surpass the new gods. Once he got there, and there will be more on this later. He either succeeded, becoming a new god with greater power than normal, or he died and was resurrected as something else. Put a pin mm -hmm. in that. We will yeah. come back to it later.
Whatever the case, Lagarde was a Machiavellian figure for whom the ends always justified the means, and in his blind rush to power he did many terrible things, slaughtering innocent people in Oldegard, purposefully sacrificing his mercenary company in a doomed assault on his own country, and lying to his most trusted lieutenant and leading her into the jaws of torment. Along the way, he fathered a child with one of the new gods, Nilvan. This would prove to be his downfall. It was Nilvan who had uh, the yes. last laugh, leveraging the weight of Lagarde's prophecy to ensure that her child would become something even greater. Her scheme was opposed by the moon god Rare, so she hid the child underground in the dungeons, and arranged to have her taken into the Heart of Darkness, a black pit located in the bowels of the gigantic carcass that was once the god of the depths. There, the girl would ascend, taking on the dead god's divinity and becoming the same sort of being as Almer, a deity on par with the old gods. Is that why she transformed? Oh, okay, well, I mean, of course. So, I mean, since I watched that last video, I was always wondering, Partially how she became what is essentially an old god, basically. Because she's the child of a new god that was wiped from reality when they were killed and somebody else sat in the seat. And, uh, a, like, the focus of a failed prophecy. So, I mean, granted, both of those, I would imagine, would have some form of, like, really powerful, like, magic or like universal power or whatever but if all of these things but if all of those were less than the old gods how did she become this but then of course if she if she was brought to like the literal core of a former uh, old god that was actually dead not like a remnant but the actual dead body of it and then just took its place and became a new god? Oh, okay. Yeah, I get, I get that poor girl. You don't want omnipotence, it's not worth it. The god of fear and hunger did not lead people away from Almer, but rather drove them forward to advance socially and technologically into the modern age. While Almer was human once, he was perfect in his divinity, something no mortal could ever be. Fear and hunger, on the other hand, knew what it meant to be helpless and afraid, and people took comfort, for once seeing a god share in their struggles. They learned to embrace hardship and let it drive them to greater heights of innovation and industry. This left the guard and his lofty aspirations in the dust. His way was the old way, and the old way wasn't going to fly anymore. Huh. He became known as a bloodthirsty madman, experiencing only failure and spreading only misery in a doomed campaign to unite the world under a single banner. He eventually faded from history, and where his name is written, he is called the Mad Yellow King. Okay. We're never shown what sort of worship the god of fear and hunger is given, or if she is even worshipped at all. The gods in this setting do not appear to rely on worship in the same way they do in, for instance, Dungeons and Dragons, and their influence extends well beyond any religious practices associated with them. Again, especially these ones, because the old gods are, like, they're... They're more akin to like the the chaos gods in 40k where they're the embodiment of concepts So you don't even have to worship them where it seems that just existing and you know Experiencing whatever they embody like may empower them if they get empowered by that at all They might just like looking at it like hey, that's cool. I like that you're doing that <laughs> Over the next 350 years Western civilization would experience the cruel age Though industrialization, the market economy, mass production, and the formation of the modern nation-state would improve life for many, these advancements just as often led to new horrors. Uh, poverty, great. new diseases, human rights violations, and most of all, war. Uh, it's always war. War never changes. The First Great War killed millions across Europa, and the Eastern Sanctuaries, now joined with Voronia in the East, formed the Eastern Union, which we can roughly equate to the USSR. Ah, okay. The continent was left in shambles, leaving thousands of orphans and throwing a bitter shadow of resentment over the Western world. During that time, a mysterious figure would take power in the country of Bremen, and under a black and yellow flag, they would rebuild. Ah, okay. Bremen is this world's version of Germany, and the sudden rise of a dictator after this world's version of the First World War should be setting off alarm bells. <laughs> the dictator would rarely be seen in public, and always hidden under a yellow cloak. People would whisper that he was the Mad Yellow King, or even a god. Finland, mm. fear I think Hunger's you might be right America, on both counts. It's only sparsely colonized in 1942 and can offer no support in the war. This is because until fairly recently, the continent was overrun with magical darkness and infested with monsters. Oh, okay. So it's no USA or Canada. Be somewhat safer. 
But this isn't really explored very well. Mm. Just know that there aren't many people living there. As the times change in fear and hunger, so too does the nature of the supernatural. By time traveling to antiquity in Mahab, cast of the first game can discover what they refer to as a mythological beast, implying that they weren't aware that such creatures actually existed. I discovered during discovered during editing that uh, this actually happened in uh, 1590s Mahab. However, the body is, is said to be very old, so. It likely dates back a few centuries before 1590, not antiquity. The point still stands, but I wanted to clarify. In the 16th century, our dragons looked more like this. Still terrible, but greatly diminished by humanity's understanding and mastery over their environment. We know from the text on a certain item that there were witch and vampire hunts in the 17th century. We'll dig more into this later, but it suggests that the more obvious monsters had been slain and the Western world was now turning inward, looking for the monsters that lurked among them. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I, hmm. Okay, so dragons did exist. They just their their physical being changed as humans grew more powerful. Huh. Okay. This is analogous to a setting like the World of Darkness, where monsters operated with relative impunity in the Dark Ages, but had to retreat to the shadows once human society became organized enough to turn the hunter into the hunted. Huh, okay. If you in America to swoop in and aid against the Bremen army, things go very badly for the rest of Europa when the Second Great War breaks out. Bremen's unchecked expansion threatens the entire Western world, and just like the Mad Yellow King of the past, Kaiser and his forces become infamous for committing terrible atrocities wherever they go. Mm -hmm. But suddenly, in the midst of what seemed like an unstoppable conquest, Kaiser halted his armies and agreed to peace talks. Now, as the war is winding what? down, a train chugs across the Bohemian countryside on its way to Preheviv. Preheviv is a city in the middle of nowhere. It's the world's analog for Prague, which in 1942 was located in Czechoslovakia and hadn't yet become the tourism destination it is today. Okay. Until recently, this country was part of the Eastern Union, but now it's been captured by Kaiser's army. Regardless of who's in charge, with hostilities ended, it should be safe for civilians to come and go. And so it is that 14 people fall asleep all at once as they approach the edge of town. The third begins by choosing a character from a sizable roster. We'll pick Marina, the occultist, for now. Oh, okay. You're in hunger mode. What is going on? Just ran up, don't you understand? We were all in? Marina nods off and experiences a strange nightmare. A nasty looking man with blue paint on his body forces her to work, fashioning cubes in a bizarre workshop made of warped wood. Okay. Cube. Oh. That giant open wound on your back, that's what's being gawked at. Assemble cube. Okay. Yay, boxes! Get your attention. Eventually, a young woman in a pink dress beckons her to come along. Oh no, run! Ugh. She tries to run away and is swiftly beaten down and punished. She ran away. Oh no. Saws both of her legs off and tells her to get back to work, ignoring her screams of agony. Oh, great! Where's this girl in pink? 
Eventually, she drags herself down a dark corridor into a bizarre hall filled with giants sitting quietly in the dark. Oh! Of course, we recognize the cubes, and we recognize the giants. The cubes appear to be facsimiles of the Cube of the Depths, an artifact that granted passage to Mahabra in the first game. And this is the Hall of the Gods, where the new gods retire after completing their tenure. Most of the characters have no idea what this place is or who these figures are, but we do, and it's certainly a bizarre way to kick things off. Very much so, yes! After some hissing static, which is something we should keep in mind, Marina is transported to the top of a tall tower beneath a warped version of the moon that stares down at her with a leering grin. Her legs have somehow been healed, and a man dressed like a jester greets her in a monotone voice. Oh no. This is Perkala. Major Majora's Mask. Master to the old god Rare, the Trickster Moon. He tells Marina that Termina is here and that she must seek the tower, that 14 must become one. His words are cryptic, but it would seem that she's been thrust into some sort of battle royale. Oh no. The dream ends and she finds the train stopped and empty. Outside, a group of people discuss the situation. It seems that everybody had the same dream and nobody can figure out what's wrong with the train or where the conductor is. A strange oh. mist blankets the landscape, and everyone's on edge. A oh god, that's just wonderful. A few of the passengers left immediately, and at least one is hiding. The rest are debating whether to walk the rest of the way to town, or to wait for help. Karen, a journalist from the Midnight Gazette, postulates that they've been subjected to some kind of chemical attack from the Bremen army and experienced a shared hallucination. This starts an argument with Don, uh. a medic, who assures her that hallucinogens don't work that way. Although he doesn't seem to offer a better explanation. <laughs> yeah. What we learn straight away is that almost nobody here knows or believes in the old gods, and the idea of a magical dream is so unsettling and strange to people in modern times that they can't quite get their heads around it. But Marina knows that the old powers never left, and that magic and mystery still lurk behind the facade of the secular world. Okay. Marina's family has deep ties to the Vatican. It's a tradition that every firstborn son in her line must undergo a lifetime of study and suffering to become a dark priest. A oh, man of really? A who follows both Almer and the old gods. Life is cruel for the dark priests, who receive great power at a greater cost. The old gods are wicked and capricious, and the men who are bound to them must harden their hearts against the suffering of themselves and others. There's no room for human morals among the likes of Sylvian and Grogoroth. Oh, that's a really depressing thing to say. So, when Marina was born, her mother simply told everyone that she'd had a daughter instead of a son. Oh, okay. And raised her as a girl to save her from the priesthood. This worked, okay. and perhaps more surprisingly, as Marina grew old enough to understand what was going on, she decided she was happier as a girl anyway. It simply felt natural to her. Okay. This may be because Marina has the changeling soul. We aren't told specifically what this means, but in European folklore, a changeling is a fairy creature left behind as a decoy or a trade when the fair folk kidnap a human baby. That, yeah, that's a, a sense, picture. That's what Marina's mother did with her, trading one future for another. Though she avoided the priesthood, Marina still received an education in the occult. She proved to be unusually talented and was eventually sent to the Vatican to study the old gods and the principles of magic, becoming sort of a dark Catholic schoolgirl. Dark Catholic schoolgirl, that's a sentence. Of divine sigils, carving them into allies' faces to grant permanent stat boosts, and necromancy, the ability to raise certain corpses as zombies to fight for her. Marina is too Wonderful. weak to wield two-handed weapons and initially lacks the magical offense. She's something of a support character, though with the right equipment, she can become very dangerous. Not long ago, Army of zombies. Marina received a letter from her dad, Father Domek. The man had always been distant and cold. Marina was never sure whether he knew about her origins or whether he was just jealous of her talent for the occult and the carefree lifestyle afforded to her by her gender. Regardless, the two had never gotten along, and as soon as she could, Marina simply cut off contact with him. The letter explained, in cold and emotionless terms, that her mother was dead, saying little else. When Marina tried to call home, she discovered that the telephone operator was unable to connect any calls in the entire vicinity of Preheville. This could be explained by the war, but still... Yeah, that's kind of weird. Marina knows her father. She knows about his obsession with blood magic, and that certain rituals require the blood of a loved one. She immediately mm. suspects he might have done something terrible, and so she has come to Preheville to confront Father Domek and learn the truth. Henrik stands around, catcalling Abella as she tries to fix the train. She snaps back at him, telling him to make himself useful. So he does just that. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm going into Fomer mode here. I'm, go I'm going to be talking about the train. Ah! 
So obviously this is like based off of something German. I think, yeah, 464. Uh, it's an engine with no connecting rods, no counterweights, and no tender. Uh, granted, every, from the little I've seen so far, it's that this it's expected that this world is at least somewhat technologically parallel to ours, but still, why? I mean, granted, the, that window at the back of the cab does offer really good uh, rearward visibility, but what does the engine burn? Henrik is a bit of an oddity. Originally from Rondon, he's rather cagey about his background and his reasons for being in Preheville. Eventually, oh, never mind. It's a two. It's a, a two six. Oh, wait. Yeah, a it's a two six four. It's quite okay. a good one. He seems rather interested in Prehevelian cuisine, but Marina, a local, says the food here is terrible. This could come down to a difference of opinion, but it leaves some room for doubting Henrik's tale, especially as this is probably the worst possible time to come here. Yeah. Even ignoring Termina, which few could have predicted, Kaiser's army has just taken the city and it seems unlikely that the fighting is truly over. So, why now? Henrik is one of the non-playable contestants. He tells us he has the smothered soul, and despite catcalling, he mostly seems like a pretty pleasant guy. If the player kills him and acquires his soul, they may gain some of his talent, allowing them to cook superior food. Oh. He's also especially skilled at melee combat, which is never properly explained. Well, I mean, granted, I mean, you could say it as if he's a chef, has a lot of experience handling knives and such, and that may somehow extend to Attacking people? Oh, okay. Henrik wanders off to try to find some food, heading north into Old Town. Several of the contestants are still waiting around by the train, and if he can feed everybody, then nobody can say he's not helping. Yeah, that good, yeah. Abella. Abella winds up going in the other direction, deeper into the forest. She can't figure out why the train isn't working, but if she can pick up some more tools or spare parts, she might be able to rig up some kind of a solution. Again, you're dealing with a steam look. Oh, granted, she, I'm guessing given that she's even trying to do it in the first place, she has some experience with having to work that thing that they call a locomotive. But still, I mean, like, you're not going to get any work done unless you have, like, heavy jacks and, like, crane equipment. Abella comes from Oldegard. At 27, she has lived her entire life under the shadow of war, which has devoured young men by the thousands, leaving towns and cities across Europa deprived of workers. Wanting to do her part, Abella picked up a trade and became an engineer, doing okay. a life of hard but fulfilling work that has left her physically fit and capable in all kinds of situations. One day, she stumbled across a wounded man who turned out to be a member of a clandestine resistance group, the Nameless Liberty Underground, or NLU. The NLU Nameless? is an international organization of freedom fighters determined to struggle against the totalitarian regimes of both the Bremen Empire and the Eastern Union. Oh, okay. These groups conduct espionage and sabotage missions all over Europa, attempting to throw a wrench into the gears of war and break down the authoritarian regimes, returning power to the people. So they're communists! Abella is here on a mission for the NLU. When the Bremen army took Preheview, a group of NLU operatives were sent to the city to get eyes on the operation, but quickly lost contact with their handlers. Abella has been sent in to find them and offer any assistance she can, having been told that she would recognize the leader of the Bohemian branch of the Resistance by her red shoes. There was definitely a girl in the dream shoes. that fit the description, but was that really her? And we got blood, great. Along the way, she passes a terrifying sight. A ruined shack with dismembered bodies nailed to the wall. Did the Bremen Ugh. army do this? Hopefully not! Another passenger comes along moments later, and they're both left staring in stunned horror. Kira Tanaka is a businessman from Edo. He's come all the way to Preheville to meet with some of the locals and secure a business deal so that his family's company can take advantage oh, of no. this poor chaos. Tanaka's latent soul is really holding him back. Though his familial wealth and connections should be opening all kinds of doors for him, the man has zero confidence and fears that he has failed to live up to his father's expectations. He's not currently a playable walk. character. But if the player acquires his soul, they're able to unlock several stat upgrades, suggesting that Tanaka might one day reach his true potential. Though kind and well-mannered, Tanaka is completely hapless and will die under several circumstances. Keeping him alive requires careful routing. Oh, okay. Karen Sauer storms off, frustrated with Don's aloof attitude and casual dismissal. She's been informed by a contact in a local resistance group that Kaiser had a very specific reason for coming here. And while she can't go talking about that to oh, a stranger, God. 
Under the circumstances, her suspicions about a Bremen plot aren't as far-fetched as they might sound. Of course, just like Hitler and like all, every single Indiana Jones, well not every single, but like it, it, like the Nazis going after like weird occult relics and stuff to it, for like the war effort and stuff. It's like, th why do the Nazis have such fascination with the supernatural? Karen was born to an up-and-coming family in the Bremen Empire. At a young age, she saw the rise of populist factions following the First Great War. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the elites threw the Sauer family to the wolves. Riots began heating up, and when it looked like their home might be targeted, the family's nanny, a woman named Dahlia, bundled young Karen up and ran off with her, taking the child to her home city of Jataya in the Eastern Union. Oh. Dahlia assured the girl that she'd been paid to take her to safety, but Karen was always suspicious that she'd actually been kidnapped. The oppressive government of the Eastern Union came down hard on the people, and while Karen had a relatively comfortable life, she couldn't stand by and watch while others suffered. She joined a civil rights group and began attending protests, which eventually led to her being hospitalized by the police. Ah. By chance, she was caught on film at the protest and noticed by Bremen authorities, who'd been looking for the missing girl. She returned well, but if she if she was taken as a baby, how would they recognize her? Because this is way before computers where you could artificially age somebody up. Her home country to find it a changed place. Her father was killed when an angry mob attacked their home, but things had settled down ever since a mysterious man known only as Kaiser became Chancellor of the Empire, despite having no apparent involvement in politics before that. Karen became a journalist, and over the course of her career devoted a lot of time to trying to figure this mysterious figure out. Along the way, she uncovered conspiracy theories about a secret society known as the New Gods, who'd been manipulating global politics to orchestrate first one great war, then a second. Okay, so new people have become new gods, and they've become essentially this, at this time in the world, they've essentially become like the Illuminati. Okay. Kaiser was said to have some sort of a tie to this group. These seemed like crackpot theories, but the more Karen dug, the weirder things started to look. I love that picture. Despite being from Bremen, Karen is staunchly opposed to the war and Bremen expansionism, yeah. and knowing that Kaiser is here in Preheville has given her the perfect opportunity to uncover the truth behind the war, unmask Kaiser, and shed light on the atrocities that he's committed in her country's name. She's Karen going to sit down and get a one-on-one -on -one interview. Like Kahara from the first game, she bears the endless soul and can similarly learn lockpicking and the improved escape ability. She doesn't have any particularly good attack skills, but she can begin play with a pistol, which can soften or even kill targets before a fight. Well, that sounds good. Do you Not have to Kamara, deal with ammo? Karen feels the pull of responsibility despite her free spirit, and works as an activist who seeks to take down the powerful and corrupt for the benefit of the downtrodden. She has I mean, an acid tongue and little least. patience for others, but despite her bristly attitude, she's learned to use diplomacy What's with to the her statue? advantage. She crosses a stream and walks along the lake's edge when suddenly a shot rings out from behind the trees. There, she spots Whoa. a man, one of the locals, taking aim at her with a hunting rifle. Ugh. His Meanwhile, face looks kind of melted. In the opposite direction, Abella comes across a cottage in the woods. She's about to ask for help, and... This is the Woodsman, an optional early game boss. He carries an axe and wears a black duster and... nothing else. He will slowly Great. approach the player character and try to attack them with his axe. But that's only half the problem. What at first Ugh. looked like dangly bits, can I- Picasso, is that you? ...quickly drop off, revealing itself to be a monstrous parasite. Ooh. It will attempt to attack the protagonist, forcing a coin toss. If the player calls the flip incorrectly, the parasite will attach to them like a face hugger from the Alien franchise, or Ooh. perhaps more aptly like a head crab from Half-Life. Okay. In battle, this is a death sentence. The protagonist becomes incapable of acting and will usually be promptly killed by the woodsman. Oh, great. The woodsman is a very difficult enemy in the beginning of the game. His axe will remove limbs when it hits, similar to the guard's cleavers in the first game. He'll also punch the player with his offhand, doing nearly as much damage, and the parasite will engage after just a few turns. Oh, oh god. It's best to avoid the woodsman in the beginning, as you can get most of the loot out of his house without fighting him, and the rewards for taking him down aren't great. If you can manage it, you'll receive a key and his hatchet, which is almost certainly a better weapon than what you started with. Okay. A note in the woodsman's bedroom and the grisly tableau in the basement paint quite the picture. The woodsman and his wife lived out here on the edge of town, and at some point they acquired a goat, which proceeded to ruin everything. What? The goat claimed his house, it took his wife, it took his dignity, and it took his faith. What do you mean it took his wife? Like, do you mean the goat killed her, or 
You mean, took her in a less savory sort of way? The woodsman locked his wife in the basement to try to keep her away from the goat, but unfortunately she met her end down there. It looks like she attempted to use her own blood to draw a sigil of the moon god rare in a ritual circle, as well as a few unhinged notes on the walls. Oh, a note great. The map reads, I will rejoin my lover on the other side. It doesn't sound like she was talking about the woodsman. Lover. Marco's on edge. Not long after everyone awoke, there was a oh. foul-tempered man getting off the train. It was Caligura, captain of a rival branch of the family. Marco grew up as a street urchin in Vatican City, doing whatever it took to support himself and his sister. Life was tough, and the other kids used to pick on him. But one day he realized he was growing bigger and stronger than his bullies, and he started fighting back. Before long, people were offering to pay him for work as hired muscle. Okay. He moved on to underground boxing rings, where he caught the attention of the family, the crime syndicate that controls Vatican City's underworld. Marco never had a taste for the criminal lifestyle. He stuck to his principles and turned down their offers to hire him as an enforcer, so they made him another one. Go pro in the ring. Oh, okay. He was confused, but finally caved, wanting to give his sister a better life. Unfortunately, she fell in love with the mafia captain who'd gotten him into the professional circuit. Of Ricardo course. Accardo. So, when they asked him to kill a man in the ring, he refused. But then they stopped asking. They had his sister, and he was going to do what they wanted, or it'd be her head. Oh, God, that don't... I swear, from what I've been hearing so far, it's almost... you. Could, I could almost see almost every one of the characters she's gone over up to this point as, like, the main character of their own movie or something. The writing in this is absolutely phenomenal. Granted, this is also, you know super condensed and information, but you know, still stands. So it was that Marco carried out the hit, beating his opponent to death during a match and making it look like an accident. Huh. The guilt tore him up, and he began to look for a way out. There wasn't one. Accardo sensed that Marco wasn't going to be happy about the situation and made sure never to see him alone. But Marco's a pretty straightforward guy. So one day, he simply went to the club and bashed Accardo's face in, then threw him off a balcony and killed him in front of all of his guys. Well, I he guess that's Marco. one way of doing it. Now he's on the run. There is no reason that Caligura should have been on a random train in Bohemia, but here he is. Mm. Marco decides not to push his luck. He stays on the train with the others, mostly keeping to himself. Marco's an incredible character. He has access to a number of unique feats that can make him a defensive or offensive powerhouse, and with barely any proficiency, wave. his fists are better than almost all of the weapons in the game. Oh, wait, really? Despite wow, okay. Despite his tough exterior and brutish reputation, Marco has a soft side. He can't help but notice the young woman who can't stand up, smiling cheerfully despite everything. <laughs> Olivia Haas has spent her entire life in the shadow of her twin sister, Rayla. The pair were born just moments apart, but the stroke of midnight came between them, and with it, the turning of a month. Thus, Rayla came into the world with the radiating soul, and Olivia with the shadowed. Oh. Oh god, that's that sounds really depressing right there, wow. Olivia was a fine scholar and a warm-hearted girl, but her sister outdid her in everything from academics, to athletics, to popularity. God, it's not hard to outdo somebody in athletics when they don't have working legs. I mean, unless you were, like, lifting weights, but even then, that... I don't know how easy that would be for somebody who doesn't have working legs. Okay. Despite this, the two remained very close, partly due to the overbearing strictness of their religious parents. During her teen years, Olivia suffered a series of small strokes and was bedridden. Uh. Olivia tried to convince her parents to take her to a proper doctor, but their religious convictions led them to deny their child modern treatment in favor of faith healers and folk remedies. Oh no. This didn't work, and finally they relented. Olivia was taken to a hospital where she was diagnosed with a vascular abnormality in her spine. She but underwent it was an operation that corrected the issue and saved her life, but too much time had been wasted on quackery. Though she wasn't paralyzed, Olivia's legs now lacked the strength to carry her. Oh, okay. She sought further treatment, but nothing worked, leaving her indefinitely reliant on a wheelchair. Oh, that sucks. Olivia began to grow envious of Rayla, who seemed to lead a charmed life in contrast. Nevertheless, the two entered university, with Rayla excelling in computer science and engineering while Olivia stuck to botany. Eventually, Rayla was invited to study abroad in the Eastern Union, leaving Olivia stuck in Bremen. She would travel all over Europa, working on top-secret projects that she said were for the betterment of mankind. Okay. It seemed like they were going well, until the Haas family was one day informed that Rayla had been arrested by the Bremen authorities and accused of treason. 
for okay. months. Okay. She rotted away in a black site somewhere until they got word that a terrorist organization called the Nameless Liberty Underground had broken her out. Oh, them! The affair left the family in shock, and Olivia recalled that the name of the group had come up years prior when Rayla cozied up with one of her professors, who was later arrested and executed for the same crime. Searching that professor's office, Olivia discovered letters between the pair, confirming their involvement in something big. Hmm. The last letter from Rayla held cryptic warnings about the Eastern Union desperately trying and failing to replicate a certain cube. This meant nothing to Olivia. It's always the cube. Dream. Rayla was worried that Kaiser was after something in Preheview. The cube! The, in the letter stated, There's still time before he gets here. I still have time. Olivia immediately left for Preheview, and she's been having nightmares about the place the whole way there. But they don't feel like normal dreams, especially after everything she just saw. No! Perhaps they were more like a warning. Oh, no. Olivia is a very interesting character. She's able to pick special herbs in the forest that can be made in incredibly potent poisons or a powerful medicine. However, in combat, she's unable to attack unless she has a wheelchair equipped. Many enemies will knock her to the ground, so unless she can rely on items or magic, she's quite vulnerable. That's just, that sucks. Oh, poor. <laughs> If, if like if the, if the, if these battles couldn't be any worse, like I thought they were bad when you could have like limbs cut off or there were attacks that were literally a coin flip whether you survive or not. But no, here we have a literal character where most normal attacks in the game knock her out of her wheelchair. That is so sad. If she's your main character, you start with the wheelchair equipped. You can use. I mean, I would hope so. It. What you'll need to do is the chair can't go upstairs. Okay. Also. Olivia needs her arms to move. If she loses one, she becomes agonizingly slow. If she loses Damn both, snake it's game over. This means she's a bit more delicate and has a harder time avoiding enemies, but the offensive power of her poisons is a sight to behold. Thinking back, so the, so the salmon snake wasn't just like some giant mutant salamander. It was like the, what was at the time, the modern incarnation of a dragon. That makes me wonder, did it gain, like, the regenerative or, like, uh, like immunity to limb loss just because it was a dragon? Or was that something it gained when it took on a form more reminiscent of, a, of like, of, of a salamander or, um, or an axolotl? That's an interesting question to ask. Huh. Find some armed guards and get a second party member, and she becomes really powerful. Armed guards, yeah. If she's not the main character, though, it turns out Olivia doesn't have a wheelchair. Someone was supposed to meet her with one at the train station, and she'll be stranded here until it can be found. Oh, okay. So stuff. So more stuff can change than I thought if you choose a different people as the main character. Huh. Karen levels her pistol at the rifleman and calls out for him to stop. There's something wrong with his face. Yes. There's no other way. He demands it. Croaks the stranger. It's Jubilee. E. Paint the town red. The man is clearly out of his mind. She calls to him, telling him to think for himself and not do something just because he's been told. The rifleman hesitates for a moment, which is all that Karen needs to get away. For some reason, I don't think it's that she easy, unfortunately. Until she's sure she's not being followed, then up into what the map refers to as Old Town. It's a maze of wooden shanties, thick with the smell of death and rotting fish. Ugh. Even by wartime standards, this is bad. And there's something else. People stand around outside in various states of undress, picking at their burnt skin until it tears away in ragged sheets, revealing raw and bloody flesh beneath. Yeah, I mean, it also doesn't help that, you know, I, I don't know whether that's just that guy that she's standing next to just had his, like, head cocked in a weird way, but it seems like his head is melting. She calls out to a few of them, trying to figure out what's going on, but she can't get a coherent answer. In you? Everyone she asks is delirious. Wait, wasn't the... Was this said in the last one, or is this something I read in the wiki? Wasn't the green hue, like, the place that the old gods came of, or the thing that the old gods were made of? Or It had something to do with the old gods. Granted, I mean, we saw the whole, like, moon guy, so that might have something to do with him. Muttering and weeping about the light that burns as it freezes, and how there's something under their skin that wants out. Under Was their it mustard skin? gas? Or maybe some sort of psychoactive chemical weapon? Whatever caused the shared hallucination on the train might have been deployed here, too. Ugh. The Bremen Empire has become notorious for these sorts of atrocities against civilians, and the reporter can think of no other logical explanation. Yeah. Logical it's is the key the word there. A man with half his skin hanging around his waist rushes at her, arms outstretched. Ugh. Nobody should be able to survive an injury like this, much less while up and running around. Karen escapes to a nearby basement, 
The place is unsettling to say the least. It opens into earthen tunnels that seem to lead all over the old town, with trash strewn about. Mm. Why have these people been living like rats? You mean war? In the dark, she spots a boy. It's somebody from the train. She calls out to him, but he startles and flees in a panic. Hello? There's a strange altar here, and other more worrying signs. A manacle bolted to the wall, a hacksaw, and a severed arm. Oh, wonderful. Old Town is a world gone mad. The townspeople wander the streets, gibbering about a festival and looking to hack apart anyone they can with knives, sickles, and whatever else is at hand. Ugh. Their faces are twisted into expressionist grimaces of pain and rage. And that guy's wearing a pig! And deformed. Marina's a practiced occultist. She knows the secrets that hide behind the veil of daily life. She can even perform a few feats of magic herself. But something like this, on such a massive scale, out in the open, with no apparent cause, it's unheard of. Today, at the very least. The dream was fascinating. Even in a dream, oh. even through a medium, Don't beat the dead horse. at a vast distance, the chance to meet one of the old gods is a rare and incredible thing. Unheard of. Yeah. But how quickly the bloom comes off the rose. Rare's green light is said to burn away the human filth, revealing a deeper truth. The great scholar Enki Ankarian argues that it's the other way around, that the filth of reality might be the truth, and that Rare only reveals the lie beneath it. Ugh. Whichever is true or false, it's clear that something terrible has happened to these people, and this is not a safe place to be. Nearly as unsettling walk to the a guy's house. populace are changes to the town. It's only been a few years since Marina left, and the place didn't used to be this haphazard. The original houses, the ones she remembered, are mostly still there, buried under the rickety new construction. Ooh. This was always the poor part of town, but in a quaint and provincial way. Where did all these ugly wooden shacks come from? Why are they built so poorly? They don't even look fit for human habitation. I mean, when you have a native saying that, especially a native of the upper class, like, oh yeah, the place used, to yeah, of course it was the, uh, the, the poor part of town, but it was poor in a nice way. <laughs> now it just sucks. Poor in a provincial sort of way. Yeah, that's that's one way of saying that. The gates into the city are locked. Oh, what the? To stop one of the passengers, a man named August, from simply leaping over them in a stunning display of acrobatics. Okay, can Marina, you do that when you play as him? Appears up the stairs, and then he's gone. What's he up to? That was weird. Map, Marina decides to head west into the Maiden Forest. There might be a way around. Mm-hmm. Now comes the thorniest part of this analysis. There are three different things that can happen here depending on who goes where first. Oh. These events are mutually exclusive and each illustrates an important event in the story. To really get into what's going on in Prehevio, it's necessary to do multiple playthroughs, as you can't see it all in one run. Wonderful. Now we're now it seems we're actually getting into the branching timeline portion of the video. But what she said, it the stuff it depends on who goes where first. Okay, that's Okay, gonna have to have to keep that in mind to help help me keep track of all of this. Karen makes her way through the old town, evading several of the crazed locals. In a muddy yard, a Bremen soldier and his horse lie dead on the ground, though what killed them is anyone's guess. Yeah, a lot of blood Her though. Her fishes a diary out of the soldier's pocket. Mostly, it's the sort of thing she's used to reading: accounts of troop movements, battlefield intrigues. The final entry is worrying though. The soldier describes his shock at the state of Pahivio, which still follows religious practices as old as the fellowship itself. Crucifixes are set up around the city, not the little decorative ones that people hang above their beds, what but the actual? big kind, the sort they used to do human sacrifices on. Oh, okay, great. Eventually, Karen comes to the mayor's manor. The people in charge may still be sane here, and if not, it's at least a good landmark to orient herself by. The place seems well appointed at first, but up close, everything looks a bit poorly. The classical busts are on closer inspection, rudimentary attempts at replicating fine art, oh. and the paintings are all drab and dreary. Okay, Upstairs, that's not she finds foreboding a man at all. Kitchen. He's from the train, right? He's acting strangely, sniffing the air and complaining about the ticking of an unseen clock. Karen has to resort to shouting to snap him out of his stupor. This oh. is Henrik. He says there's something wrong with this place and that it was affecting him. That's a worrying thing for a guy to say, especially as he doesn't immediately leave when he realizes what's happening. Oh no. But Henrik's on a mission. The train's not going anywhere, and no help is coming anytime soon. So the best thing he can do is feed everybody. I mean, that's a, late, that's a very important to thing to do. He just can't find them, and he's not leaving until he's got something to show for his effort. Karen begrudgingly decides to help. 
A few rooms over, she discovers a dark priest engaged in prayer. Finally, oh, it's that noise. someone's sane. So you think! Her father ignores her words, advancing on her with one arm outstretched. The other arm now cut off. Now closer, she can see that there's something wrong with him, too. His skin is dry and cracked, looking almost mummified, and he doesn't respond to her words at all. The dark priest is sort of like a mini-boss. He has a coin flip attack which can end the fight immediately. Oh! You'll wake up, flogged bloody and nailed to a cross with your legs gone. Oh, great. I'm Wonderful. Until it's night, and August, one of the other contestants, will have to come along and save you. If you have a rifle, you can take out one or both of his arms to soften him up before the fight. He telegraphs the grab by grinning beforehand, so just guard and you'll be fine. His right hand casts Hurting, which can sever limbs, and the left casts Pyromancy Trick, which can light you on fire. This is a pretty deadly combo, as you'll usually be too focused on getting rid of the right hand to avoid the damage over time debuff, oh. and the fact that you have to waste turns guarding so that he doesn't grab you really allows the damage to add up. Oh, that sounds great! Karen ducks around a corner and finds a hatch in the floor. The strange priest does not follow her down the ladder. Dark oh. priests hold on to all kinds of creepy old religious beliefs, but the Vatican's toned most of it way down over the centuries. Mm. Is this guy just affected by the same madness as the rest of the town, or is he up to some weird occult business? Karen's uh, a pragmatic woman with little love for anyone in power, but aren't priests supposed to help people? What the you hell is think? going on? She manages to snag a set of keys so that she can search the place. The rest of the manor is in disarray, but there's nothing too unusual, despite the ominous presence of another shackle in the basement next to a door that won't open. Oh no. Hmm. Not like the look of this. There are food supplies down here, though. The mayor must have stockpiled them when he heard things were going south. There's enough to keep a household fed for weeks. She helps Henrik gather Could up whatever help he can and prepare him back least. to the train. It'll be goulash for dinner, he says. A local favorite. Local favorite, as if they have any other choice. But yeah, I mean, a, a warm meal in the belly does help the mind immensely. Marina manages to fend off an attack from a pair of headless wolves that spew bile as they try to run her down. Headless Wounded, wolves? She stumbles onward until she finds... A truck. Is this an army vehicle? It looks like someone's tried to get into it and broken the lock in the process. Okay. There's a hatch in the ground nearby, surrounded by barbed wire. If this is some kind of military facility, maybe there's someone inside who can help. Even getting arrested for trespassing would beat getting torn apart by crazy townspeople. No, yes, very much so. The hatch, as it turns out, leads down into a sprawling network of tunnels. There are months-old newspapers left out on the desks, suggesting that this is not a facility built by the Bremen invaders, but rather one that the Eastern Army abandoned as they retreated from Bohemia. Still, this might be a good place to hide, and it might even have guns lying around. Yeah? The idea of picking one up is uncomfortable. Marina's the kind of person who certainly doesn't want to kill anybody, but things being how they are, it might be better to be prepared. Says a, uh, says a student of the, of the Dark Gods. Unfortunately, there are no weapons here. Makes sense. The army probably doesn't want civilians wandering down and finding that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's mostly old tools and clunky machinery. This hat on the floor looks out of place. Tanaka gasps and oh. struggles hopelessly as the tall figure pins him down. A bone saw chews through the flesh of his neck, blood spilling everywhere until his head rips free and his body hits the ground with a soft thud. Oh no! Okay! So you can Marina just shoves it. a metal crate into the doorway, blocking the figure in. She only gets a brief look at the smiling killer, but he looked like... a clown. Oh no, of course it's a clown. He's trapped where he is, at least for now. She could run, but it's no better outside, and there might still be somebody down here who needs help. The occultist fills a generator with gas, powering on the elevator, and heads further down the tunnel. Something, somewhere, is banging on the sheet metal walls. Oh, I don't like that. Oh! oh. The creature looks like a hulking man with something like an elephant's trunk, and as it shrieks and trumpets, mucus dripping from its snout, Marina feels a crushing pain in her head. Oh. She runs, circling around the creature in the maze of tunnels until she reaches the elevator and heads down. Is this this game's version of the of the crow guy? Now it's just a giant elephant man! Oh, God. So freaky! There's a burst of static in her ears, and she sees the flickering, ghostly apparition of a young woman. Uh -oh. She runs down the hall as if urging Marina to follow. The beast from above bursts through the wall to give chase, but this time there's nowhere to run. There's a dead soldier on the ground, but checking for a gun reveals only a key and a letter. Oh no. 
Necromancy! Use the necromancy! The occultist mutters an incantation to Grogoroth over the corpse and it rises. Born again as an undead ghoul. At her command, it throws itself into battle with the monster. It doesn't last long under its pummeling fists, but it buys Marina enough time to get away as the beast smashes the zombie to the ground and destroys the fragile spell holding it upright. Ugh. Marina gets a brief look at some kind of a machine with what looks like blue moths fluttering around it. Blue but there's no time moths? to check it out. She ducks into a side chamber only to discover... a ritual room? She knows what all this stuff is for. That's a rare circle on the floor, but why would... The metal and concrete oh, of the bunker has been okay. replaced by wood and unending darkness. Where the computer once stood now lies a fleshy creature like a fish with a snake in its mouth. That's just weird. And that is it for part one to this very long reaction. So, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner cards will lead to not only my Let's Play of the Day, but also all of the other parts of this reaction. But if you want to just move on straight to the next part, you can click on the link around here.